All right, here we go. Okay, um, today we're gonna discuss mosquito sex changes. I, I do like this paper, I like this paper a lot. Um, so the paper is a science paper. It's a little bit older now. Um, what year is it? I should look. What did you say? 2015, okay, 2015. So it's a little bit older, um, but it's still novel in a lot of techniques. Um, first authors, Hall and Basu, I think it's a co-first authorship. And then there's corresponding authors, Jake Tu. Um, he's at Virginia, I think he's at Virginia Tech. And then Zach Edelman, who's a mosquito CRISPR expert. Okay, so let's discuss the paper. Um, what is the question that they are studying? Let's first outline that. Help me out. What is the sex determining factor? The genetic factor that influences on the yes. sex determination. So essentially, how is sex determined in 80s Egypti? That's probably a good way to say it. Because all insects, not insects in general, because all insects are going to be a little bit different depending on what sex determination mechanisms they have. Why study this? So females bite, right? So, so maybe like a weird idea would be, well, let's just like sex change all the females to males, right? Like that would be an interesting idea. That is actually like an idea. Uh, and you could potentially do that. Why else study this? What do you think? There's a, there's a few other reasons. Um, yes, I, I would consider that sort of within the line of this point one. Um, it, the, the goal is to definitely sort of use this somehow for biological control or like maybe genetic control. Maybe you could use this as like a jumping off point for further research. Into what? Um, well, they were able to completely Well, I think that's more to do with the efficiency of the microinjection system. Um, we'll talk about that in a second. Yeah. So maybe like a stress, like more disconnected, but what if uh, once knowing the sex determining factor, you could determine what the cause of reproduction of it is? Would that never make any sense for like a sex change like that? Yes, that's actually the point that I was looking for. Very good point. Um, I'm trying to phrase that for everybody else. Controlling sex, so controlling, or actually the way, the best way to say it is sex separation. Sex separation is extremely important for insect biocontrol methodologies. Uh, Kyle mentioned SIT, which is a sterile insect technique. We're gonna talk a lot about that this semester. And essentially like one of the requirements of doing, being able to do sterile insect technique is to be able to sex separate. And there are species where there are uh, sexual dimorphisms, it makes it a little bit easier, but there are also other species of insects that um, sexes are pretty much the same and it can be very difficult to sex separate them. So uh, my point is that sex separation in general is kind of like a basic area for research and being able to do it with a genetic mechanism Either you just kill all the females or perhaps in this case, you convert all the females to males. That would be super useful for actually implementing sterile insect technique. So in a rearing sense, mass rearing, a whole bunch of mosquitoes, and then all of a sudden at the flip of a switch, you change them all to males. That would be super helpful. And then also final point, um, sex determination. Um, sex determination is a fundamental sort of like scientific thing. So it's like you think applied research, basic research, sex, like we should try to understand how sex is determined as sort of a basic research uh, idea in different organisms. It's a fascinating area. And then also the evolution, this paper also touches on the evolution of sex and evolution of sex chromosomes, which is really interesting from a, um, basic science standpoint. So these are all kind of the reasons why I thought this is very important. It's definitely a very, it actually is a very applied paper in a sense of, it's actually very practical what, what they're trying to figure out and how useful it is. Um, okay, so here's, here's another, another thought. 
question. The genome of 80s was sequenced before this paper. Like, why, why didn't we know? Why didn't we know uh, how sex was determined just based on the genome? Like, based on genomic comparisons? That's not they, why. They mentioned something about there being so many repeats. Yes. Um, that, What's the issue with repeats, and what is a repeat in they're DNA? Hard to sequence. They're hard to sequence. So we talked a little bit about repeats with the CRISPR stuff. Um, why do you think repeats create situations where you get like it's it's hard to sequence? And actually, what's really hard is the assembly, the assembly of the chromosomes and the genome. Yeah, so assembly of genomes is essentially run by algorithms, and the computer algorithms just essentially, you get what are called reads, okay? So you'll get a read of set length one to n base pairs, okay? And essentially, you can assemble a genome from scaffolds, and the computer algorithm will figure out where the reads align, and then based on that, it will essentially like align and construct a genome, okay? And so if you have a bunch of chromosomes, you'll essentially just get a bunch of reads until you go from the left to the right of the chromosome. And if you have multiple chromosomes, you'll do this a few different times to get all the assemblies. Okay, this is what's called assembly. So this is not only do you, like sequencing involves multiple steps. It's not just collecting the sequence. After that, there's a long process of assembly, okay? And if you have regions where there are repeats, so it's the same thing, like imagine you have a bunch of these red things, okay? The algorithm does not know where to put these because essentially like you can't, you can't, you can't derive this simple sort of like overlapping structure where there's unique overlaps if there are a whole bunch of repeats. So this is a huge problem for assembling eukaryotic genomes and typically what happens, what happened with the 80s genome assembly, um, and fact check me, correct me if I'm wrong, but essentially like what happened with the 80s genome is they sequenced a genome, most of the genome was assembled, okay? But there were these small regions, small repeat regions, which were kind of like left unassembled. Um, forgive the spelling left unassembled. And so, interestingly enough, so Kyle brought up the point, um, you could sort of just like look for, if you were trying to, how do I spell this? Help me out. Thank you. How many PhDs does it take to spell unassembled? <laughs> I'm a bad speller. Kyle brought up an interesting point that you wouldn't, um, if you had a genome, so imagine you had a genome, how, how would you scientifically go about figuring out what gene was a sex determinant um, without doing all the fancy experiments? Like what would be sort of like the easiest first step? And you kind of said it. Oh, uh, you could just check the database and see if anything is lacking in that like similar. Elaborate on that. So you're saying if the database flagged something as similar, how would it flag something and what would that entail? Okay, so after, that's good. So after assembly of genomes, there's gonna be a phase of annotation where now you have some like assembled chromosomes. Uh, what Kyle said is an algorithm can look through and find what's called the ORFs, which are the open reading frames. These are the genes, okay? And then essentially like the computer algorithm will just take the sequence of each ORF, it'll blast it, it'll find what are called, what are they called? Orthologs, that's the best word for it, orthologs or homologs essentially like other genes that are very similar to the sequence in other organisms. And it will ask the question like, what do they do? Are there any papers that have been written about these genes before? And if they are, if there is information about these genes, it will kind of like load information about that gene that it theoretically like propagates 
from searches in the literature. So this would, in theory, be the easiest way to figure out how or get a hypothesis for how sex determination happens in mosquitoes. You would probably just blast the genes against the Drosophila genome. You'd try to find orthologs, and you'd probably try to make some hypotheses. Or you wouldn't make conclusions, but you'd make some hypotheses based on sort of a genome alignment against probably Drosophila or maybe perhaps another mosquito. So they actually say in the paper like why that didn't work. Did anybody catch it? And it, it has to do with the repeats. I'm just kind of asking you to connect the dots. Like, why couldn't they just blast the genes and find the sex determination pathway? Were those um, repeats just of like the many repeats instead of specific for the um, species? Because some of those were exclusively for male and female? It's, I think you guys are close. Essentially, like the genes that you would expect to be the homologs controlling sex determination, they were stuffed inside the repeat regions. So they didn't actually have annotated genes for anything that was like orthologous to classical uh, or to the, I, w I don't want to say all, but to the key factor they didn't find that gene. It didn't exist in the genome assembly because that gene was contained inside of these repeat regions. And so through this problem of sequencing repeats, they kind of like whoever sequenced the genome, they kind of just missed the key gene because it was in this important region. Um, this brings up another, another question or I guess another thought of why. Why was um, the key gene, which they call the M factor, we might as well define that now. What's an M factor? It's essentially like one gene. It, it's a theoretical one gene that controls all maleness. Like if you turn it on, you get males. That's what they're defining as sort of like M factor. And the M factor was stuffed within this repeat region, so they didn't have um, a sequence for it. And so why was the M factor included inside the repeat region biologically? How do you think that happens? Because you need repeats of that factor to create males? No, well, that's, a, that's, an, interesting, uh, that's an interesting hypothesis. Um, there are cases where you do need, like, copy number is important for sex determination. So that's a really interesting hypothesis. Um, but that's not correct for insects. Essentially, like the, these repeat regions lie on these chromosomes that are undergoing evolution towards sex chromosomes. So it has to do sort of with like the evolution um, of sex chromosomes. So we'll spend a little bit of time. I'm going to write real bad. <laughs> really bad here. Uh, I've spent a little bit of time talking about evolution of sex chromosomes. Okay, so there's um, what are called homomorphic and heteromorphic sex chromosomes. Okay, and humans are what? Heteromorphic. They're heteromorphic. We have XY systems. And it's called XY because females have essentially like the double X, males have an X and a Y. And the Y is actually a unique chromosome. It's actually a unique chromosome that carries unique genes and females do not have it, okay? That's heteromorphic sex chromosomes. Heteromorphic is sort of late in the stage of sex chromosome evolution. So have you ever heard any of the funny jokes about like what's happening to the Y chromosome in males? It's like shrinking and it's like dying. Um, the Y chromosome is essentially, Y chromosome is essentially like collapsing, falling apart because it can't, it doesn't, it can't recombine. Whereas the X chromosome, if you're a female, you have two copies of the X, and so it can re recombine and you can repair genes on the X chromosome. You cannot repair genes on the Y chromosome because there's never a situation where you get a YY. So what happens with male chromosomes is they sort of, it's really funny, they sort of, I should make a comic on this, they like, they like start to fall apart and you start to get like weird mutations. Um, okay, so the homomorphic uh, idea is you have two chromosomes that are 
they're, they're close enough that they can recombine, okay? So it's early in the stage of sex differentiation or sex chromosome evolution. And what starts to happen is these M factors, M factors, or it could be like a female factor, it doesn't necessarily have to be a M factor, but essentially like one of these chromosomes starts to develop or catch or hold on to um, genes that control one of the sexes. So M factors sort of in this in 80s are starting to sort of like pop up on one of these arms of one of these chromosomes. And M factors are things that control only programs that happen in males. Um, there's, no, there's no utility for them in the females. And so you start to get regions where recombination starts to like not happen. So in this region, no recombination is happening. There's no recombination. And that's because the female, what would you call it? The female analog of this chromosome doesn't have, it doesn't have these ORFs. It doesn't, it, these are actually unique sequences. And so there's no sequence for which that they could, they can recombine. So you start to get these situations where um, they don't recombine. And then you can imagine that homomorphic easily evolves into heteromorphic by just sort of like progressive expansion of collecting things that are sex linked. And then you get a, a slow progression of less and less and less recombination until eventually the entire pair stops recombining. And then you are now heteromorphic sex determination. Okay, But the state of Aedes aegypti right now extant in evolution is essentially like three fourths of these, I don't know if it's three fourths, but from the picture, three fourths of these chromosomes recombine, okay? But essentially like one fourth doesn't. And this one fourth contains like a whole bunch of these repeats. And this is sort of like the arm that was very difficult to sequence, okay? So this is kind of an interesting little tidbit on evolution of sex chromosomes. I find this pretty- so yeah, you're seeing it happen. That's kind of my point is you're literally like, if you study this, you're seeing it happen in, you're getting a snapshot of like the process, like a picture of in the timeline of progression. So it's actually like really fascinating. Just a hypothetical, when, would you see a more like homogeneous sex You mean like what, what is the final outcome once they're completely separated? That's an interesting question. I'm, um, I mean, that's, it, it, it might, oh, I don't know. I was going to say, I mean, that's, a, that's at the point at which you start, would start to see like a degradation, right? Because it can no longer recombine. I don't know. I'm not a sex chromosome expert. I'm going to dodge that question for now. <laughs> Good question though. Okay. Um, Okay, so now there's a let's let's quick a few more definitions that should help understand the paper. M locus versus M factor. What is they use both of these terms in this paper, and they're quite important actually. What's the difference between M locus and M factor? Is M locus just the region? Yes, M locus is this region in this homomorphic sex chromosome that is not recombining. And you call it the M locus because there's multiple, there's multiple genes there. There's multiple genes on that part, that arm of the chromosome. Whereas M factor is kind of like what we said. It's like the gene, the gene, the single one that controls maleness. Okay. So that's the difference is one's a region, one's an actual gene. And the region contains, in theory, the gene, the M factor gene. And when they started the paper, they did not know what the M factor was. That's why this paper is important. They discover it. Um, so that is what an M locus is. Okay, final concept, or maybe not final, but another concept we need to quickly review is genetic linkage. What's genetic linkage? <coughs> together. Yeah. So essentially, if you were to draw like a diagram, let's say you have one over here and two over here. Okay. 
And if you have a situation that looks like this, okay, let's consider these the same genes. And let's say the distance between these genes is something like 20,000 base pairs. That's pretty, pretty decent size, okay? And let's say in condition one, the distance between these genes is only 1,000 base pairs. Just by understanding like probability rolling the dice, is it more likely for a recombination, if a recombination hits, is it more likely for it to hit in a space that's 20,000 or 1,000 base pairs? One or two? Wait. Okay, we're not understanding something. So recombination in theory is just pretend it's random, like random recombination. You're just rolling a dice to determine the site of recombination. Is it more likely recombination will happen between these two genes in two or between these two genes in one? Let's everybody say it. <laughs> two. Yes, it's much more, just, this is just simple math. Like you're much more likely, you have essentially 20,000 chances here and 1,000 chances here. Like it's a little bit more complex than that probably. There's probably some site specificity, but this is essentially like linkage. It's that genes that are very close together are very unlikely to get broken apart by recombination. Genes that are far apart, you'll see a lot of shuffling and a lot of mixing because it's easy for them to get split apart. And oftentimes things that are linked together function together. Like sometimes there's an evolutionary essentially like advantage to that. And so you can imagine as this homomorphic region where there's no recombination is sort of expanding, it's essentially like acquiring a whole bunch of male sort of like factors not necessarily the male factor, but a bunch of things that are important for being a male that are linked together genetically on this site of the chromosome, okay? And it becomes harder and harder and harder to break those things apart as, they get, as they're close together, et cetera. Okay, so that's genetic linkage. Essentially, things, genes that are close together, it's hard to break them apart because there's just, it just doesn't um, happen as in high probability. Okay, let's see, we got that. Okay, so final thing about the M factor. Their definition, they actually give a definition of an M factor. They say it requires a certain set of things. What are those things? Did you catch that? Yes, it's a, it, they, they actually say, quote unquote, persistent, persistent M linkage. So, so that means essentially if there is any M factor, it must by default be linked to this homomorphic M locus region. That's characteristic number one. What, what were you gonna say? It has to be present in the embryonic Yes, so I, instead of present, I would say expressed. So everything is gonna be present because all genes are gonna be present in all the cells in terms of the DNA. But whether the gene is on or off, it must be on, it must be expressed. So making RNA must be expressed at early embryogenesis. And this is because sex is determined quite early in development. Like it needs, at some point you need to decide, are you a female or a male? And you need to actually spend the time to develop those organs. Otherwise something very bad is gonna happen. So um, essentially a M factor by default must be expressed at early stages in embryogenesis. Um, and then the final thing, these are sort of like the two requirements. And then the final thing that they're sort of adding in is their hypothesis that there must be just sort of like one factor. So I guess the final thing would be it controls, controls maleness. So this is their sort of like curt definition of actually like what an M factor is. Um, okay, final piece of background information before we start digging into the paper. Um, I just want to sort of give like a brief primer of sex determination in insects. Every insect is like really different. Insects are so diverse. There's so many different things going on, but there are some sort of like common patterns. Oftentimes what's involved is alternative splicing. So what do I mean by that? Who knows? Yes, so eukaryotes have what are called introns and exons. Which ones exit the nucleus? Exons exit the nucleus. That's my little, that's my little rhyme. Exons exit. 
the nucleus. So exons become messenger RNA. Introns get spliced out. So in eukaryotic genes, when this thing gets transcribed, you'll get this like long transcript, okay? And then splicing will happen and it will reduce it. Here there's one, two, three exons. It, splicing will reduce the transcript to essentially your three exons. And then the mRNA will exit the nucleus, go into the, find the ribosomes to get translated, okay? So a brief primer on splicing. Alternative splicing means that eukaryotes have developed um, vast ways to increase the diversity of the amount of things that they can make based off of the same sequence. So if you have one gene, but you alternatively splice it in different ways, you can produce many different products. So one alternative splice of this particular random gene might be one, two exons, and then you just leave out the third exon, and this is a totally different translated protein than this one, because you're leaving off the entire C terminus, okay? Or you can get situations where exon one perhaps gets made and then two gets spliced out, but three is left in, okay? And this would also be a completely different protein that would be missing essentially this middle chunk. Okay, so alternative splicing is a way to make like different variations of the same protein. Um, and this is very, very commonly associated with sex determination. So oftentimes in insects, there's a, feel, a female splice version and there's a male splice version. Okay, splicing is different whether you're a male or a female. And there's often key genes, depending on how they get spliced, they initiate a cascade. And once that cascade gets initiated, now you've been defined as either a female or a male. Okay, so in fruit flies and in most insects, there's sort of like classical genes that um, you probably want to know their names. Um, you, I won't make you memorize them, but just so that you've heard them before. There's one called SXL, which is sex lethal. There is TRA, which is transformer. There is uh, double sex. I think it's, I don't know the abbreviation. DSX. DSX, thank you. Double sex. And then fruitless. These are all like weird gene names. Essentially, again, like the point is, Essentially what happens is in sex determinant insects, sex determination in insects, a cascade of splicing happens where something hap needs to be like the first determinant. Maybe in the case of fruit flies, it's sex lethal. And however sex lethal is spliced, causes tra to be spliced differently, causes double sex to be spliced differently, causes fruitless to be blah, 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 blah. And then you eventually get either a female or a male. That's essentially like how insects are determining sex determination. Obviously, there are differences to this. This is not the rule. There's never a rule in biology, but this is sort of like the theme, okay? And this is definitely the theme of how the paper addresses the issue and what they discover in mosquitoes, which are very similar to fruit flies in some sense that they're dipterans. Okay, now we've done all the background information. Okay, so the first experiment, so experiment one. Um, experiment one is essentially like they need to find, they want to find candidates for this M factor. So what's their strategy? What do they do? Compare, compare, um, Even before they compare, what do they do? They separately sequence males and females. Separately, oh my God. males and females. Why would they do that? What's the rationale there? Just explain that to me so I make sure you understand it. Yeah, they're gonna do comparative genomics. If there is an M factor, it's gonna be present in the males, not present in the females. Okay, so they're specifically doing this. What are they doing differently from before when they sequence the genome? I guess the main thing that's different is they're probably sequencing um, males and females separately, whereas you might you might pool them if you're doing the first genome. I'm not sure what they did in the first genome, but that's one difference. What else are they doing that is going to allow them to discover uh, this M factor? Uh, 
they identify the candidate, they're going to evaluate the phenotypic changes in the males when the factor is not present. True. That's definitely like downstream. They're definitely, once they find a candidate, they're going to break it and they're going to see what happens. But even before they do that, like, how are they going to identify their candidates? That's definitely a part of it. So remember their definition of an M factor was it must be early expression. So they're going to do, they're going to couple this with some kind of RNA sequencing or reading technology. But even before that, like even before that, how are they going to develop their list of candidates? So they have quantitative compar or comparative genomics. What do they need to do to the reads to figure out which ones are in the male and not in the female? Maybe it's too comp or too simple. I'm Separate so essentially, like they they're gonna they're gonna um, they're gonna quantify the reads, okay, from males versus females, and they're gonna calculate what they call. This is actually kind of an important little thing that they define. They call it the chromosome quotient. Very simple calculation. Does anybody did anybody catch what it is? So they're going to take all the reads and they're going to take copy number in female divided by copy number in males. And this is a very easy sort of like an algorithm can do this with all the reads. And they're going to get different values. Okay. If you got a value of one, what would that mean? What? Really? One would they be? Yes. So what would that be? So there's a word for that. It's, um, Autosomal. Yeah. So if you get a value of a perfect one, it means it's both present in males and females. That means it's not doing anything for sex. Well, okay, that's, it could still be doing something for, for sex determination if it was alternatively spliced or something. But essentially, like, they're looking for something that's unique. So they're going to sort of classify out all the one values, okay? If you get a value of zero, what does that mean? No, there. Uh, in what? In what's female, I guess, is it situation. If it's female, yeah, it's not in females. And let me make sure I get this right. And then the males, um, what, what would happen if it was greater than one? Hang on. If there's more copies, if it's greater than one, it's just going to be more copies in the females. Am I calculating this right? Greater than one, that would say like five versus one. Yes, it's going to be more copies in the females. And if it's le if it's if it's essentially like closer to zero, it would be not in the females. And so, which ones would be the ones you would want to look for? Yeah, the one's closer to zero. I hope I'm calculating this right. Double check me on the paper. Uh, if I'm not online, people would be very furious with me. <laughs> um, but I'm pretty sure it's this. So it's essentially like the main point is they have this little neat calculation that they can do. They can just sequence the genomes. They do a little algorithmic calculation, and then they screen out and they get the best candidates based on these little chromosome quotient numbers that they calculate. So from this, what did they generate? How many, how many candidates did they get? 100 and I think it was like 64, 64. And now Kyle, uh, what's step three? How are they gonna reduce that 164 candidates? They'll do some kind of like RNA expression analysis. Okay, so you could either do RNA-seq. I think they did do some RNA-seq and then later they just followed up it up with the RT-PCR. Um, but essentially from the expression analysis, the M factor is going to be one of those 164, but it's also going to only be one that is expressed early on. So you can generate two sets of data. This is called, um, what do you actually call this? There's a mathematical term for this, but essentially like you have your set of 164 chromosome quotient ones that you're looking at, and then you have a bigger set probably, I don't know, thousands, that is expressed early. Yeah, Venn diagrams. Yeah, Venn diagrams. 
And then you just essentially see where these overlap. Okay, so if you see where these data sets overlap, you redraw these circles. You see where these data sets overlap. And then essentially like whatever your M factor is, is gonna be in this set. Oh, it's called set theory. A complicated mathematical way to do something very simple. <laughs> Hopefully a mathematician does not watch that. <laughs> so essentially like then they do that and then how many candidates do they have? It's vastly reduced to essentially like 24 candidates. Okay, that's actually like a feasible number that you can start doing some scientific analysis of. Okay, so that's the first experiment. None of that is actually like really in the figures, but that's actually kind of like a big important um, experiment. Okay, so now let's look at their figure one and let's explain this data. Let me pull this down here. Okay, so here's figure one. They now do a whole bunch of other experiments. Explain to me what's happening in A. It's very simple. This is just a straight up PCR. Do you have the gene or not? Okay, and they're comparing male versus female. And look what you see. There's a PCR, if, if you haven't had PCR, okay, these little bands, that's signifying that they see the signal. Okay, so, <coughs> excuse me. So it's present in the males, it's absent in the females. This is like the simplest experiment to interpret. What's, uh, yeah. Is that RPS7, is that like the control? Yeah, I was gonna explain that, that's a good uh, question. Uh, that's a, that was my next question is, what is this RPS7? Why do they have that? Housekeeping. It's a housekeeping gene. What's the purpose of this control? It is a control. DNA yeah, it's a control for whether you did a good DNA extraction or not. Essentially, you cannot conclude that something's not there if you haven't demonstrated to me that your DNA is of good quality. So they're demonstrating here that their DNA is of good quality. They can do a PCR with a housekeeping gene, but when they PCR for this other gene, it's definitely like not there. So it's a key control. You'll see this in sort of like any PCR figure. You'll always see like a DNA control. Yeah, that's an interesting question. I have a whole like video on that um, for scientific illustration. Um, my experience is that um, if it kind of has to do with reputation, like to be honest, some labs are very trusted. And so for them, it wouldn't be as big of a deal to crop. Here's what actually happens if you submit. So this is science. If you submit to a high impact journal, you can have cropped figures in your, in your paper, but then in the supplemental data, they you typically ask you to upload the raw like data file. So that, just like you said, so that people can go in and look to make sure that the PCR is okay. So you're right, that they're sort of like cropping out very important information in a sense of like there isn't a ladder. We're kind of giving them a lot of benefit of the doubt. But the hope is that the reviewers reviewed it. And in most rigorous journals, you have to also upload like the raw images. That's a good point, good question. Um, okay, let's look at, um, let's next go to, so this is kind of like, this is one of the, one of like the monies, that's money. What's this one? What's happening here? What is this type of experiment? It's fish, so explain for everybody what fish is. And the function of fish, so it's fluorescent in C2 hybridization. The function of fish is to localize a gene. Like where is a gene on a chromosome? Obviously that's important in this situation because they're looking for like this, the location of this M factor. To understand this figure though, you need to know what J2 is. What's J2? Very good. It's a transgene that's close to the M locus. Okay, so let me explain this. Um, oftentimes when you're reading papers, you're reading like a culmination of a lab's work for the last like 10 years. 
They probably had some papers before this where they developed this J2 thing. Essentially, like when they were searching, I don't, I don't know, I haven't read the papers, but I'm, here's what I'm presuming. I'm presuming that when they were first searching for the M locus, they probably designed some kind of a strategy where they would insert transgenes randomly. And then they would try to figure out which transgenes became naturally like sex, sex associated, like sex linked. Does that make sense? And from those studies, J2 arose as one of these transgenic inserts that randomly inserted at a location that was like pretty closely always present if you were a male, but absent if you were a female. Okay. So it's essentially linked. It's a transgene that's linked to the M locus. So does it transgene mean that? They inserted it. Oh, okay. So typically, you're you, probably they're using transpo. Or again, so I'm going. I haven't read those papers. I'm presuming that this is information that was not included. Well, it was included in the paper, but blah blah blah. blah. They probably had a transposon, which is like a jumping gene, and you can hack transposons to like toss in the gene that you want. So they probably did a transposon screen, and then they found this J2 insert, which was linked to the M factor. All you need to know is that they've established that this J2 is very close to the M locus. That's the main point. J2 is linked to the M locus. So now you can interpret the data. What do you conclude from this data? Red is Nix, blue is J2. Nix is also close to the... They're right next to each other. It's, it's not hard to interpret. It's very simple. It's essentially like red is next to blue. That's it. They're close to each other. So Nix is now established as a good candidate for the M factor because it's close to the M locus, okay? And then they sort of hammer in the third sort of like money figure, which is C. What's happening in C? What is this? Yes, yeah, so this is RT-PCR. This is not PCR. It's measuring transcript, messenger RNA. So it's an expression. And these are ours, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, blah, 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 post overposition. So essentially it's expressed at hours four, five, six, highly at seven, and later at 10, 11, 12. Essentially all these are pretty early. This is early development. So does it meet their criteria of an M factor? Let's check the boxes. It's linked. It's lim linked to the M locus. That's this figure, check. It's expressed early. That's this figure expressed. And it's only present in males. That's this, okay? So it's actually not that hard. It's a very, very simple figure to interpret. E is just sort of like a redundant test of A in a different methodology. Um, okay, now let's go to figure two. Here's where it starts to get interesting. Okay, so now Daniel, you suggested once they have this candidate, now we can start to like break it, mess with it, and see what the phenotypes are. Okay, so here D, that's the that's the money. Essentially, on the left, that's control. So here's a here is male. Okay, male. On the right, that's female. Essentially, like here's what females look like. We just had the lab, which is great. Here's what a female sursus or ovipositor looks like. Here's the female antennae, they're not so bushy. Here's a male, you can see its palps and you can see its bushy antennae and you can see its gono stylus little claw things in its reproductive organs, okay? So it's essentially like, these are the things you wanna look at. And what are they gonna do here? What's the experiment? So they, they used the CRISPR files, right? To yeah. erase NICs, like doing some kind of knockout. Yes. Uh, male embryos yes and those are the fem feminine no wait no those are the experiment and then the columns in a are like the outcomes yes which were feminized malformed or typical or not affected yes very good very good daniel so they're going to micro inject um they're going to micro inject an rnp which we discussed last time so it's the ribonuclear protein complex it's got the cas9 it's got some guide rna and the guide rna guess what they engineered it to target which is they gave it a name what was its name nix they gave it a name it has some kind of like uh greek mythology connection um something like that so essentially they micro inject this rnp with nix 
If it works, they microinject it into eggs. If it works, it's essentially going to <coughs> snip, snip the, that's a funny, <laughs> it's going to snip, snip the, um, the M factor. It's going to snip, snip NICs. And essentially, like, whatever happens, happens. They're going to look at the readout, and they're going to look for some morphological differences. So they do these microinjections, and here's what comes out. They get a bunch of hermaphrodites. Um, like, clearly hermaphroditic phenotypes. This is essentially, like, look, look at this. It's kind of like half male, half female. It doesn't really know what it wants. And these ones, the female antennae, they look more like female antennae. They're pr pretty much feminized. So you're seeing this sort of like hermaphroditic feminized phenotype by doing knockouts of the, um, of the Nix gene. Why are they getting these sort of like intermediate phenotypes, which raises the question that you were asking, like what the pictures that you're showing you are like not complete conversion. Why do you think that is? That could be, that is a common, that is a common um, issue with microinjections is, are you hitting it early enough? Like you have to collect these eggs and if you don't inject them extremely early, you might hit them at a later stage where they've already got some sort of signal going there. So that's very good, the, the stage. The stage might not be super consistent in like when this is, when this microinjection is happening in the embryos. What else? I'm pretty convinced. I mean, it, it's pretty convincing to me that when you, like, I, I would not suspect that there's other factors because it's pretty convincing that when you knock out this and you get phenotypes that look like this, like that's, that's pretty, that's pretty good. But it's always possible there could be something else. Could it be like incomplete knockout, like some loss of function? But yeah, why do you see that? We actually talked about that issue yesterday. One of the main problems, or not the main problems, but like one of the issues with, with first round CRISPR injections, what do you get? What are they called? Mosaics. So when you do a CRISPR microinjection first round, if you're a lot of times, if you're like hitting somatic tissues, you, it doesn't hit them all totally efficiently. So you're probably seeing like mosaic effects. It's not that it's not, it's not that that's why I'm not as inclined to think what you think or, or what you thought is because you're probably just seeing mosaic effects. Um, and so you're seeing effects where some of the cells got hit with the modification. And that also has to do with the stage, which is what, um, Claire brought up. So that also has to do with that. So very good. These are, these are essentially probably why you're seeing um, these different phenotypes. Okay, we got to finish up here. Um, essentially this, this is essentially, remember I talked about how they have these alternative splice variants and some of these are male forms and some of these are female forms. And in the hermaphrodites, guess what they see? They see like, they should be the male form, but they see an increase in the female form. So essentially like this is, they're seeing female specific splice variants of this sex determination pathway, which suggests that they've, they've really hit the pathway pretty good. This is essentially like expression analysis. Like you might look like a female, but are you actually expressing genes like a female? And it's essentially showing you that expression patterns of, of female specific genes um, get upregulated in these hermaphrodites where they're knocking out this male factor. Okay, and then the final experiment, they do it the reciprocal way, which is what? It's kind of the same experiment, but like, let's do it the opposite way. Is adding the gene to the females. Yes. So see how they masculinize. Yes, it's exactly the opposite thing. In this case, they build a plasmid, and just like we discussed, they have a, a, a polyubiquitin, so it's a promoter, a ubiquitin promoter, which is essentially a strong constitutive promoter, so it's always on. And then they just put the next gene upstream of that promoter and they microinject this plasma. And if it works, they're going to see masculinization. And now they actually do dissections. So here's wild type testes, here's wild type females, and they see sort of like things that kind of look like testes and kind of look like ovaries. It's essentially like, again, it's, it's making these morphologically hermaphroditic mosquitoes. Okay, so it's essentially like this paper is a really good paper because they 
all the conclusions you draw are based on multiple experiments that are done in different systems that all tell you the same result. They try to do experiments reciprocally, like you do it one way and then you flip the scenario and you do it the other way and you get the same result. So it's a really good paper. Um, it's a really important discovery. And we will talk in the future about how to loop this into sterile insect technique and genetic modification of mosquitoes and why this would be useful. But I think it's a good paper. Um, any final questions? How come they didn't, how come they didn't do uh, the microdissection from the Male well, that's a good question. Why didn't they do it on the? It probably didn't look as good as the other one, so they probably left it out. That's a funny. They're worried about sterilization. Sterilization? What do you mean? Oh, well, I don't think they're making, I don't think, are, are you talking about like if they would make like F1s or F2s and like try to breed the line? Well, you can't breed a line that's all males. So they're not, they're not generating any like F1s or F, they're all, this is all data from F0 microinjected. So also, like, just to see if even this particular thing is sterilized. Like, so they're just checking like how to form their reproductive system. Yeah, I don't think they did any mating experiments. I think there's actually follow-ups where I think you can actually convert mosquitoes completely and they can become like, like they can be genetic males that you then do the SNP and they become females and they can reproduce or vice versa, I think. But I have to check on that. Um, that's sort of like what's happening right now. Okay. Is there a possibility that they can like pass on the system that they can insert it into the mosquito? Hang on, let me conclude the meeting.